Give it up for Jordan Burroughs. Thank you, guys. JB, when did you know that you were different? It, it took a long time. Like, I never really had this epiphany or this, like, aha moment where I started to realize I was really good at this. But I had a lot of people when I was young that would pour into me. I was always a, a words of affirmation guy. So the more people told me I was capable of, the more I started to access more of myself and my abilities. My dad, when I was a kid, we were down in Jacksonville, Florida, where he was born and raised, and we were at a family reunion. And so we were all down there, and I'm meeting all my cousins and family that I had never met before because they were down in Florida. I grew up in New Jersey. And so I remember while we were down there, we're all playing on the field. We're out at this campsite, and my dad's linking up with some of his cousins that he had grown up with, and they're all introducing their kids. And I was like, okay, this is my two boys, and this is my son, this is my daughter. And so then my dad points at me, and he's like, this is my youngest son. He's like, his name's Jordan. And I'll never forget this. And I was kind of like off playing. We're playing catch. And my dad says to, to his cousin, he says, I think he's the one. He's, he's got something special. And so when I heard him say that, I kind of turned and I like ran over and he like shooed me away. He's like, get out of here. I don't want, want you hearing these things. My dad always had expectations of me at a young age. And with that, it gave me kind of passion and purpose, but also... It was frustrating because there are a lot of times where my reality didn't align with who he thought I was. He wanted a lot from me, but I didn't think I was capable of being the person that he thought I was. You said two things, special and words of affirmation. What are the words of affirmation you give yourself? Hmm. You've got to continuously influence yourself positively. I think that it's easy to, to, to think negative thoughts about yourself. We have this inferiority complex. I think all of us, to a certain degree, we have a little insecurity that we're dealing with daily because we live in a life of constant comparison. Every time we go on social media, every time we walk through the hallways of the classroom, every time we spend time with our siblings, our families, we're always comparing ourselves to see how we measure up against people that are around us. And what... I try to do is, is live in a, a, a constant place of peacefulness and contentment. It's like before a horse race, the horses have these blinders on where no matter where they are in the race, they can't see who's beside them. It helps them stay focused on the finish line. It's the only thing they can see. And for me, the finish line is, 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 are my goals that I've set for myself. It's who I am, the way that I display myself to the world, my perspective of the world, my abilities, the condition of my body, the condition of my mind, all those things are what I focus on. And I've learned in that insecurity to, to, to celebrate others actively, to willingly kind of display gratitude as often as possible. And that kind of brings me back to a, a stillness and a place where I'm like, I'm content with my life no matter where I'm at. So I, I have to always affirm myself to... to First, be thankful for my station in life, but also to understand that if there's more for me, then hopefully I'll get to it. Now, you said the word special. Dad said, this one, Jordan, is special. Yeah. What is it that you think is special? You know, I would say the distinguishing trait between me and my, my peers is, is my ability to, to stay disciplined in any circumstance. Like, I have an extreme level of, of determination, and I think that's connected to my pride and my sense of, of, of belonging. From, from the day that I started wrestling, my goal was to always achieve. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an achiever. I was a person that always wanted to, to go out and do more. Um, but it shifted from proving myself to my dad to proving myself to the world to now just proving to myself that I'm capable of doing great things. So that's why I still wrestle, like even in well into my 30s, not because I'm making money or because I get recognition from the world, but because I need to be challenged daily in order to be at my best. Because without challenge, without obstacles, there's no level of, of inspiration that is necessary to push yourself. So it's like, if I have nothing to do, then I do nothing. But I ha if I have a goal that's really difficult, it, it, it changes my, the way I navigate life because now I have to, I've got to eat well, 
I've got to go to sleep on time. I've got to listen to my coaches. I've got to be at practice multiple times a day. I've got to grind with my training partners. All those things are important to me. So I have to have challenges. So yeah, I, I would say the determining factor between me and my peers is, is discipline, determination, and uh, in the willingness to be vulnerable as often as possible. What makes you feel vulnerable? Um, life, life, like being, being, living is difficult. And I think all of us in this room, all of us in, around the world, we all have a desire to be meaningful to someone. So every day we're, we're, we, as we go through life, we're trying to figure out what am I good at? What could I do well where people will recognize me for it? And will that give me value? Sometimes you find something that you're good at that people recognize you for and you realize it's not what it was cut out to be. And it's not as exciting as you thought it was. Then you realize that when you constantly leave, live for the applause of other people that it's, it's unfulfilling, it's fleeting, and that you can't really access it as often as you hope to. So, yeah, I would say vulnerability to me means presenting myself to the world in an honest, transparent, and an organic way. That's how, what people connect with most. They need to know that you struggle. They need to know that you struggle because you identify with it because we all have that internal struggle. Whether you display it to the world or not, whether you're willing to say it, everyone has their own personal demons that they're dealing with. Uh, I asked you last night, I said, what was the hardest loss you've ever had? What was mm -hmm. the most difficult loss? And you said uh, Rio in Rio, 2016. Yep. And uh, then in 2017, what, what happened? It was a world champ. World champ. Didn't make the Olympic team in uh, 2020. Yeah. And then the year after, what happened? World champ. World champ. <laughs> I think that deserves a round of applause. That's what I think makes him special, is when many people would say, I can't, somehow, somewhere inside the being of Jordan Burroughs, he says, I will, mm. and then he does. And each moment seems to build more confidence, strength, conviction, and purpose for the next day. Where do you think that is? Like, when does it happen? Is it the next minute, the next day, the next week? It, 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 you know, depending on the, the, the significance of the loss, it, it takes some time. It does take some time. I don't lose and get back to training the next day. That's not how I operate. I, I, I try to feel the sting of the emotion of the moment, right? I'm not like uberly positive where I'm like, I can forget the very next day. But here's one thing I mentioned a, a couple weeks ago. Tom Brady, who, any, any football fans here? Yeah. You got a couple football fans? Okay, some football players in the crowd. Who, who do many of us consider the greatest football player of all time? Who, who's won the most championships of all time? Tom Brady, right? So Tom Brady. So, <laughs> what's up, guys? So Tom Brady. We started a sports debate. <laughs> so Tom Brady, someone said Pate, man. <laughs> So Tom Brady's won seven Super Bowls, seven Super Bowls. Many consider him the GOAT of, of his sport. He's won seven Super Bowls, but Tom Brady's playing in his 23rd season. 23rd season. So let's go back to a year ago. He played 22 seasons. He was Super Bowl champion in seven of those seasons, and people consider him the greatest of all time in his sport. So that means of 22 seasons, he had only won seven Super Bowls but people still considered him the GOAT. And what I started to experience and, and, and realize was when I watched the best athletes of all time, they don't win every time. They lose, they feel the sting, they go home, they brush themselves off, they take a vacation with their family, they spend their time in the off season getting refocused and they get back to work the very next season. You know, after that Olympic Games in 2016, I took about two and a half months off. I went to a training camp in November in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center, and I, I wrestled with David Taylor, actually, one day. And I hadn't wrestled in literally two months. I hadn't even touched the mat, put on a pair of shoes, and we won a simulation match, and it was like seven to six. He beat me by a point, and I hadn't wrestled in two months. And I text Lauren, my wife, that night, and I was like, I'm still good. <laughs> and she was like, duh. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course. She was like, of course you're still good. You had a bad day. You're still good at this. One event, one loss doesn't change who you are. One win doesn't change who you are. I think we're all greater than our worst loss, and we're never, never as good as we believe we are at that current moment. We all have the ability to get better and improve. So perspective, perspective. 
What's the difference in your perspective at age 14, 24, and 34? Because I know we got 14-year-olds in the, in the audience. We got, we got wrestlers in here? I can't Make really some see noise. you guys. Let's Sorry. Go. I'm so, that was, let's that see. Was if, you're, if you're a wrestler, raise your hand. Dang. Oh, they put the wrestlers in the front. I like that. <laughs> I like that. We always got to sit in the back. No. When I was in high school, no one liked wrestling, right? So we were considered the weird kids. And uh, no one would come to our meets. We didn't have a lot of history. We didn't have, no, there was no tradition. So all the girls, they loved the football and basketball players. So we were jealous of those guys. We hated them. <laughs> um, no, but uh, we, we had all parents and family members who come to our wrestling matches when I was in high school. And it was a very intimate group that we had grown up through the youth program together. And we all went to high school at the same time. We stayed in our district. We didn't leave and go to private schools. We all wrestled for our local public school. And so we had a great team. And uh, I remember in that time period, the things that were most important to a high school wrestler was you wanted your name in the paper. That was important. And it, even better, if you got your picture in the paper, you're a boss, right? And so I remember that was important. Then you wanted a varsity jacket. If you were district champ or state champ, you get the fresh varsity coat with your name and weight class on it. Your state says state champ, that was important. And then lastly, you wanted the cute girl to come and see you compete, right? <laughs> that was important. You wanted, you, wanted, you wanted the ladies to come and see you, but, but they didn't. Um, <laughs> because wrestling wasn't popular. My senior year, I won a state championship, finally my senior year, and I was on the front page of the sports section of our, our local paper in South Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey. And I carried it around. I used to carry my books, but I put the paper on top of my books. So every time I go around, I sit my books down with the paper face up so people could see it, right? <laughs> and like, people were looking at it, and they are like, wait, is that you? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, you, you won a state championship? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, cool, well, see you later. <laughs> so it wasn't really a big deal, but it meant a lot to me. I stayed the course. And a lot of my friends played football, they played basketball. Wrestling was weird, but I, I loved wrestling and it was what I was good at. And I knew that it would give me access to do something different. And so then I got a scholarship to the University of Nebraska and, and I started to, to become a professional. I started to operate like someone who really wanted to be a champion, everything that I did. But my goals as a, as a young freestyle wrestler were, this is when Instagram and Twitter were just starting to explode and start to blow up. I wanted followers, I wanted fame, I wanted recognition, I wanted money. All the things that I never got as a, as a high school wrestler. Right? Now I'm going from obscure parents and, and family members in the stands no one cared about who we were. No one knew I was a state champ. To now all of a sudden, we're competing in full arenas and getting paid well and having thousands of followers. And so this stage made me everything that I wasn't my entire life. And so you kind of get jaded in this process and you start to lose the essence of why you truly do it. And it was kind of this stage where I had to reposition myself and resettle myself as no, this isn't what's important. If you win, you take care of business, all these things will be afforded to you. From that stage in high school, just wanting to be recognized to wanting to be recognized by the world and then wanting to enjoy the, the fruits of my spoil to now I'm in such a, a stage of purity where I'm about the performance. I wanna give my best performance. It's like an artist. You wanna display your best wrestling because I know that I don't have a lot of time left in this sport. Every time I compete, I'm closer to the end. And so I'm always looking for that flawless performance where things are flowing and I can see it ahead of time and enjoying the moment, being present, yeah. When you think of, of wrestling as art and you think of yourself you. as a creator, what do you hope the, the viewer of the art walks away with or feels mm. is probably more a more important question. What do they feel? An, an unconquerable spirit, a warrior-like spirit, a guy who is the ultimate competitor, who never quits on any position. You can tell a lot about someone by the way that they wrestle. Not whether they win or lose, but in the manner in which they compete. It's hard to beat someone who never quits. And what I've learned in my, in my experience as a wrestler is you reveal who you are through the way in which you compete. So if everyone in here is a competitor, most of us are athletes, you can watch us compete and you can get a lot of 
a viewpoint into the, the perspective and the soul of that person based upon what their insecurities are, what they're afraid of, how brave they are, how courageous they are, what they're willing to give. Like I think all of these things are revealed in, in our, our competition. And that, that's the beauty of it. You don't have to preface it. You don't have to tell them who I am, what I've accomplished. You just have to watch me compete. And so that's why I'm most disappointed after a loss. Not because I got beat or someone was better than me on a particular day, but more so that usually when I lose, it's not because he beat me, because I beat myself. I didn't do enough. You know, I, I feel privileged right now to have this conversation. I know every single person in the audience is going to have a special connection to Jordan Burroughs that they didn't have before. Yes. That when, they, when 2024 comes and the Paris Olympics uh, arrive, yeah. I think Jordan Burroughs should be the flag bearer for the United States, walking in, holding the stars and stripes. That'd be dope. <laughs> with, with many, many hearts and souls behind you. And I, I, I know I speak... I think the wrestling world will root for Jordan Burroughs, not just uh, the American people. So that's the power of sport. Now that you're, you're, you're coming to this stage where it went from, I, I would love to be recognized by the girl in my high school, to now uh, a worldly responsibility uh, or a spiritual responsibility to mankind. How do you look at that? How do you feel about that? And, yeah. and, and what's your vision? When I was young, I wasn't prepared fully for this. There was a grooming phase that I had to go through. When I won the Olympics in 2012, like I wasn't a role model. I was just a guy who was really good at wrestling. But when I realized the impact that I could have on the world, I immediately went into this phase of, of training, not only to be a great wrestler, but to be a great human. And I recognized my, my position was bigger than myself. To whom much is given, much is required. There's a big responsibility. You've heard the quote, heavy is the head that wears the crown. So when you're the king of something, you're really good at something. You've been blessed with these gifts. If you're a good steward of those gifts, it means that you have a civic duty to all the people whose lives are intertwined with yours. There are people who have met me. They're like, man, you're the reason why I started to wrestle. And clearly we know what wrestling's capable of creating within an individual. What do you hope your life does for the world? I hope it allows people to find their purpose and their passion and to pursue it with, with, with intent and, uh, and, and be deliberate, living on purpose. Like, what is it you want to do? What is it you want to achieve? If you don't know what that is, work as hard as you can in everything that you do. There are a lot of people, I can ask everyone in this room, what do you want to do? And they're like, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. But the only way to be prepared when that day does arrive where you do know is to be your best at every opportunity that you have. And so I, I, I try to maintain this, this, this recommendation for all young athletes especially. They ask me, what would you tell your young self if you could recommend something now? And it would be to be prepared, start to prepare now, because you never know when you're gonna go from unknown to overnight success. You toil behind the scenes in the darkness with whatever it is that you love, and eventually you get so good at it that the world cannot ignore you any longer. But you have to be prepared for it. And if you're distracted in other places in your life, it'll squander your capability of being, of being great at what it is that you love. You mentioned distraction. How do you, how do you minimize distraction? It's hard. How many people here have a cell phone? How many people here have a cell phone? Raise your hand. Good, all right, hands down. All right, how many people have social media? I'm sure the social network. All right, hands down. All right, that's why I need you guys to go home and delete it. All right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, honestly, there are a lot of distractions. I saw a quote one day, and it, it was really good. I'm, I'm probably going to butcher it. I don't remember it specifically, but it says, the great thing about social media is that if there's ever a moment in your life where you say you didn't have time for something, social media will remind you that you did. All right, so think about all the time that we spend. There's, a, there's a, a, an hour log in all of our cell phones. Anyone who has an iPhone has a log of hours of screen time. And if you just keep this thing on, you realize just how much time you're spending on social media. If you do something for just one hour a day, 
for an entire year. At the end of the year, you've spent 15 days doing it, 15 days, right? So if you're on Instagram for an hour a day, every day, you spent 15 days total on Instagram. Imagine what you could do and improve at if you spent 15 days on it. And so for me to avoid distractions, I keep the main thing the main thing. I focus on what I want to get better at. Instagram doesn't make me better at anything that I really care about. I spend too much time scrolling and watching other people live their lives instead of creating my own. You want something to post? You want valuable content? Live. Put the phone down. Stop watching other people do cool stuff and do cool stuff. And I think that's what we always have to remind ourselves is whenever I go to social media, I go in looking for entertainment and I leave with insecurity. It overpromises and underdelivers. I'm like, and this guy got a new car. They bought a new house. They're on vacation. They got married. They got into the school that I didn't get into. You know, it's, it's, it's so hard to be content with your own life when you're watching the highlight reel of everyone else's. We, we have the ability to be great at something. A lot of us don't know what that is yet, but we have to avoid distractions in the process in order to find it. Hypothetical. Yep. Gene in a bottle. You don't get three wishes, you get one wish, and it's only for the world. What would you wish one for? One wish for the entire world. One wish for the entire world. Mm. You can't wish for more wishes. That's tough, bro. Wow. That's so hard because the, 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 the general response would be world peace, right? But if, the, if, if we, I asked for world peace and there would still be millions of people who were, who were starved who were impoverished, if I asked for, for hunger to end around the world, there would still be people getting killed because of war. You know, it's, we live in a, a tough world. I would just say, I would say for, I would say for everyone to, to, to have a measure of faith, I think would be the most important thing because for everyone to be introduced to, to the faith, whatever it is that they follow. For me, I follow, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a Christian. That gives you a level of, of, of contentment and peacefulness and of joy and, and understanding unlike anything else could. And what it also does is it gives you a promise of, of more than you may currently have at this moment. And Unlike any meal could or, 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 or any measure of, of, of peacefulness between governments, I think that, that God's peace transcends all. That's what I would ask for. For every person in the world to have faith. Jordan Burroughs, man of faith. Here you go. We got like one or two minutes. We got like one or two that minutes. That was so fast. I know I got a, I got a million more questions. Uh, any any last things you want to say to the? No, I would. You know, guys, I. You guys have stuff that you have to deal with that we never even imagined, um, and it's crazy because I didn't have social media in high school. When I was in high school, the very first social media came out when I was a senior in high school. That's how old I am, and it was MySpace. They didn't even have Facebook until I got to college, and you had to be in college to have Facebook. I didn't have Twitter until my senior year of college, and I didn't have Instagram until I was already graduated from college. There was no Snapchat. There was no Be Real, whatever this new thing is. Um, there was no TikTok. None of this stuff existed. So like, we were just in a different era. So these guys are dealing with stuff that we never really had to deal with. But here's what I can tell you. No matter how insignificant you feel at this very moment, each one of you is going to be someone who people are going to rely on at some point in your lives. No matter how small you are, how little success you've had, whether you're the youngest sibling in your family, the oldest, your parents have a healthy relationship, they don't. The teachers love you, they don't. If you're, if you're popular amongst your peer group or not, at some point, all of you are going to be someone that people rely on. You're going to be fathers, wives, moms, husbands, CEOs of companies, employees, coworkers. You're going to be relied upon by people that are looking up to you. 
And in order to be ready for that moment when it arrives, you have to start to prepare now. And so think about what you want to do, who you want to become, and who you want to be. Start to surround yourselves with people who are like-minded, individuals who live clean lives. We would always break it down. We say hard work, clean living. I want you guys to also remember is that you are valuable. You are worthy of being loved, of being treated properly, of being respected, and of being admired. I think that we all have to remember that we are valuable, even if we don't feel it. And lastly, I always tell my kids two things before I, I leave the house. I say protect yourself and protect your family. One, protect yourself. Put yourself around people that care about you, that you can rely on. Put yourself in situations that are, are going to help you stay safe and stay healthy. And always surround yourself with environments that are conducive to the goals that you have for yourself. And then lastly, protect others means that there are people who don't have the ability to protect themselves. And that, that need powerful, more brave, more courageous people alongside them to stand up for them when, when they can't for themselves. And so you guys all have a responsibility to do that, not only for yourself, but for, for everyone. Yeah. Jordan Burroughs, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.